Great. Thank you, Heather. Uh, so maybe I'll just do a quick introduction first. Uh, my name is Donna Tafreshi, and I work as a project manager and analyst at the BC Office of Patient-Centered Measurement. Um, and I'm going to start us off here today. Um, I think maybe I'll just start off by going through the objectives, and then I'll talk about how I'm going to hand things over to Lena and Rick and introduce them as well. So the first objective is to introduce BC patient-centered measurement data and the BC patient-centered measurement working group to the broader research community. We also want to introduce the BCPCM to Health Ideas Initiative and formally announce the release of data to researchers via population database starting today, actually. And then I'll also provide some background information on the first sector survey data to be made available. Uh, that's the 2016 and 17 acute inpatient survey. And then I'm going to hand over the mic to Lena Cuthbertson and Rick Pulotsky. Lena is the Provincial Executive Director of Patient Centered Measurement in BC. And she's going to talk about patient reported experience measures or trends. And then we will pass the mic over to Dr. Rick Sawatsky, who is the Canada Research Chair in Patient Reported Outcomes. And he's going to talk about uh, patient reported outcome measures or PROM. And we're going to focus on the tools that were used in the acute inpatient survey. And then finally, we'll hand it over to Sarah over at POP Data, and she's going to provide information on how researchers can request access to PCM data via data BC. So first, I'll just give a little bit of background on the BC Patient-Centered Measurement Working Group. So the Working Group is a joint initiative of the BC Ministry of Health, all seven BC health authorities, and their affiliate organizations. And since 2003, the BC Patient-Centered Measurement Working Group has led BC's strategy for patient-centered measurement using scientifically rigorous survey instruments that give people who use BC's healthcare services the opportunity to assess the quality and safety of the healthcare system from their perspective. The patient self-reports of their experiences, and more recently, since 2016, their health-related quality of life and healthcare outcomes are solicited using PREMS, or Patient Reported Experience Measures, and PROM, Patient Reported Outcome Measures. So the mandate of the BC Patient-Centered Measurement Working Group is to develop a coordinated, cost-efficient, and scientifically rigorous provincial approach to the measurement of patient and family self-reported satisfaction, experiences, and outcomes in order to enhance public accountability, support QI and evaluation, and to inform research. And over the years, since 2003, we've had a number of accomplishments that we're quite proud of. So first, we've coordinated uh, province-wide surveys for 13 plus years. We've received feedback from more than 1 million users of healthcare services across 13 sectors and subsectors in all age groups. Uh, we collect both quantitative and qualitative data and report on both kinds of data. We provide practical support to make effective use of data for QI and for accountability. And we will be providing support to researchers as well going forward with the release of data and POP data. So we do public reporting and we do also have the availability of the data to clinicians and analysts across BC uh, via an online platform called the DART, the Dynamic Analysis and Reporting Tool. And today marks the first day that the data will be available to researchers uh, in, through POP data. And that's through a collaboration with the Ministry of Health, uh, Health Ideas uh, database, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, but currently, health authority analysts and Ministry of Health analysts also have access to the data through Health Ideas. So there are a lot of ways to listen and learn about patients' experiences and health-related outcomes. The BC uh, Patient-Centered Measurement Initiative uses a number of different... The, result, the data was released in 2018. That is the most recent data we have available. Sorry. I think maybe somebody can just mute the noise. All right. So the BC Patient-Centered Measurement Initiative uh, uses a number of different techniques. Uh, to listen and learn about patients' experiences and their health-related outcomes. For example, we, re we recently conducted focus groups with patients across the province to ask them what they think the role of patients are in patient-centered measurement. Uh, but the data that we're introducing today focuses on one particular technique 
which is the use of provincial patient-centered measurement survey data. So in British Columbia, we employ a patient-centered measurement value chain in the impl in implementation of our surveys. So this begins with survey uh, selection or design. So this includes the selection of survey tools with strong psychometrics, development of tools or custom questions, and defining methodology. We then do data collection. So we distribute surveys, we collect completed responses. We then do data analysis, so we process the surveys, we collate the results, we sometimes do case mix adjustment and we wait for disproportional sampling if necessary. And we analyze the data, report on the data, we pr produce provincial and health authority level results as well as facility level results. And the results that we report on are both quantitative and qualitative, both graphic and narrative. We share the results, uh, so we disseminate the results to stakeholders and we do public reporting to the general public as well. And then we do action planning, so knowledge sharing, promoting mini surveys or point of service QI initiatives. Sometimes we do secondary analysis and promoting uh, cross health authority collaboration and we recommend targets for accountability and system level improvement. Now what makes this patient centered is that at the center of this our patients. So we try to include the patient voice at every uh, step of this value chain. And so I mentioned our focus groups that we did across the province recently. Uh, that was to also inform this value chain. How could we include the patient voice uh, more regularly? So for example, we include patients in our consultation groups. Uh, we include patients in the selection of our survey tools. We include them in the sharing of the results and in action planning as well. So from whom have we heard? Well, we've heard from over 1 million DC patients or family members in a variety of sector surveys, including acute inpatient, outpatient cancer care, mental health and substance use, long-term care, um, emergency department, and uh, I think I already said mental health and substance use. So this chart shows a summary of all the different sector surveys that we've conducted to date. So our long-term goal is to re release all of the legacy data and upcoming new data from current surveys to researchers with supporting materials. So a lot of this legacy data is already available in the Ministry of Health, uh, Health Ideas database, uh, but we will release it through POP data uh, through a phased uh, release plan. So we want to release the data when we have supporting materials and metadata available. So as you can see, we have conventionally employed, employed point in time surveys, but we are moving to a model in some of our sectors that utilizes continuous surveying. Uh, many of our surveys also use mixed mode sampling methodologies, including surveying by phone and or online. And we've also conducted in-person interviews in the long-term care sector. So our upcoming surveys in 2019 include surgical services, particularly hip and knee replacement, uh, primary care, and we also have an upcoming cross-sectional blended survey uh, that uh, blends the emergency department and the acute inpatient. So all of this data is being moved into the Health Ideas Ministry of Health database. So the Health Ideas is the ministry's integrated data warehouse environment, and it provides access to administrative and service event data to authorize users for analysis. The overall goal of Health Ideas is to support secure access to a wide range of ministry data sets, either to users within the ministry or to external users for approved purposes. And this project, uh, where we're moving patient-centered measurement data in BC into Health Ideas at the ministry, is funded by the Strategy for Patient-Oriented Research. So the Canadian Institutes of Health Research uh, define patient-oriented research um, as being conducted by multidisciplinary teams in partnership with stakeholders, as engaging patients as partners, focusing on patient-identified priorities and improving patient outcomes, and as aiming to apply knowledge generated to improve healthcare systems and practices. So with SPOR funding the movement of this data into health ideas, uh, they are supporting expansion and collection of patient-reported experiences and outcome measures across BC, and linking uh, individual prem and prom data with other healthcare data in the provincial data platform. 
So this is just a quick overview of the project timeline for the movement of PCM data to health idea. So you can see here that we started all the way back in 2010 with the Health Information and Privacy Council uh, agreeing to the return of raw data to each originating health authority and providing guidance on rewording of cover letters to pro promise confidentiality but not anonymity. And this makes our data linkable and it will be linkable uh, in POP data as well. Um, I think with the current release uh, today, uh, I'm not sure if it is linkable as of today, but I think we're hoping going forward we can link the data uh, to other data sets in the ministry, uh, Health Ideas database. So this leads us to today, uh, where researchers are obtaining access to data via POP data, beginning with the acute IP 2016-17 sector survey. And this will be followed by the Emergency Department 2018 survey in the coming months. And this is a list of all of the current data that's in the Health Ideas database. So the green rows are the ones that are uh, currently available and the yellow ones are in progress. So these data sets are available in the Health Ideas database, and, but as I mentioned before, we're releasing them through a phased rollout. So we're starting with the acute inpatient 2016-17 survey. Uh, we want to go next with the emergency department 2018 because that's very recent and we know there's a lot of interest in it. Uh, following that, we are hoping to release the uh, Office of the Seniors Advocate 2016-17 survey. And we also want to connect with researchers who are interested in this data to know which of these sector surveys, which of the legacy data they're really interested in. So at the end of this presentation, I will provide some contact information. If you're interested in some of these data sets, please do get in touch with us um, as that will inform our rollout plan. So as I mentioned, rollout will be in phases, starting with the acute inpatient 2016-2017 survey. So I'll give you a little bit of background information on this survey now. So first, just a quick overview of the method of BC surveys. So how, does, how, does, how do we generally go about implementing a survey when we do patient-centered measurement? So the first thing we do is we conduct the patient survey. So we do quantitative and qualitative data uh, collection um, in standardized, consistent manner. And we use scientifically rigorous instruments um, and we follow all of the BC FIFA requirements for privacy and information security. And then we do close to real time, uh, we provide close to real time access to scores via our web based reporting platform, the DART. And the data is intended for local hospital and unit level quality improvement. So things such as local tests of change throughout the time that the survey was in the field. Then we clean and we conduct analysis and adjustment of the data. And then we publicly report provincial and health authority results. And then finally, we'll be moving the raw data with identifiers into health ideas. So at this point then, the data would be made available via POP data to researchers who then can do secondary analysis with the data. So the acute inpatient 2016-17 data was collected from two rehabilitation facilities and 78 acute care hospitals, so in total 80 participating facilities in BC. Our total sample size was 24,279 patients and our response rate was 46.9%, about 47%. So this slide just gives you an idea of the number of respondents from the different health authorities and their response rates. So you can see we, uh, the participating health authorities were PHSA, Vancouver Coastal Health, Island Health, Fraser Health, Northern Health, and Interior. So in terms of data collection, uh, we used a random sample of discharged patients drawn twice a month for six months. The mode of delivery for the survey was using phone interview following a mailed notification letter, and there was also an online option that uh, participants could choose to use. In terms of reporting, we provided static and canned reports and an end of survey project plus dynamic reporting in our dark tools. And the instruments used in the survey 
uh, were the CPES IC and BC modules that Lena's going to talk about in a little bit. Those were the patient reported experience measures. And we also use the BR12, which is uh, the patient reported outcome measure that Rick will talk about in a bit. So, what patients were included with the inclusion and exclusion? Uh, so, we included patients who received care in a BC acute care hospital on an inpatient basis and were discharged between September 1st, 2016 and February 28th, 2017. And then we had a number of exclusion criteria. So, for example, uh, patients who passed away during their hospital stay were excluded. Uh, patients who had a day uh, surgical or ambulatory procedure uh, who were not admitted were excluded. Infants less than 10 days old were excluded. Uh, patients who passed away after discharge, if we knew about it, were also excluded. Uh, this detailed information about data collection and methodology uh, will be available in supporting materials that we provided uh, through POP data. So researchers who do request access to the data will have uh, toolkits, and technical reports and materials that really go into detail about all of this information. A little bit of uh, information about the demographics of the respondents. So 58.1% of the respondents were female and 41.9% were male. And there's a little bit of information about age. And note that these numbers are based on weights applied to correct for facility volume. So we use weights to correct for disproportionate sampling. Uh, so we may sample 100% of a very small facility and only 50% of a large facility. So we use weights to correct for facility volume. Some more respondent demographics. Uh, we also ask about self-reported uh, ethnicity. So this question is adapted from the BC, uh, or sorry, Statistics Canada uh, question. And again, the numbers here are based on weight supply to correct for facility volume. So that's it for me. Just a little bit of background on our working group, so the data going into health ideas, and the survey coming out. Um, I think we can take a moment to pause if there are any questions for me before I pass it on to Lena. Should I carry on? Okay, should we move on, Heather? Um, sure, and I think if people are kind of thinking of questions as Lena's presenting, feel free to send them into the chat again. There's a lot of people online, so you can raise your hand because I don't think we can unmute everyone at the same time. <laughs> um, go ahead, Lena. Okay. So thanks, Donna. Um, so as Donna indicated, um, I've had a long-term role um, with the uh, BC Office of Patient-Centered Measurement with accountability for the strategy for our um, patient reported experience and outcome measurement. And so Donna has uh, uh, identified several different um, uh, key timeline milestone dates. So in 2003, we began our provincial initiative um, to uh, bring patient voice to the forefront. Um, in 2010, we began the discussion of making uh, data available through the Ministry Central Data Warehouse. And today, um, we're announcing the release of uh, the data to researchers. So I just want to take a, a little step back um, as, uh, to look at where did, where did all this start, so by way of an introduction to this work. So the language of patient-centered care was actually coined in the 1980s by the Picker Institute, and it was really the seminal work of the Picker Institute that shaped our thinking in BC about how and why we engage patients in providing their assessments of the quality and the safety of our healthcare system. And the result was the development of a strategy for BC, which as Donna indicated, 
started in 2003 that really made a statement that said, we value um, and we will measure the uh, patient perspective. And we were definitely ahead of our time because in 2017, the ministers of health from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD countries, met in Paris, and the outcome of that meeting was the following statement. They said, we need to invest in measures that will help us to assess whether our health systems deliver what matters to patients. This is a really strong statement based on the conclusion that our reliance on mortality rates and clinical indicators to assess the quality and the safety of our healthcare system gives a very important but only a partial view of the value of healthcare. We know that what people really care about is the impact of our healthcare services on their well being and their ability to play an active role in their lives and in society. And that's what we should be measuring, not instead of the clinical indicators but rather in addition to clinical indicators. So what you see here in this schematic is an attempt for us to be able to demonstrate that we value both, but with the important caveat that the only way to measure what matters to patients is to ask patients, and in some cases, again, as the schematic indicates, their family members, and or their family caregivers, but we have to ask them directly. So a major program of work on patient-generated and patient-reported indicators of health system performance is now underway internationally. The OECD has persuaded 19 countries to adopt a common set of PREM indicators to enable comparison. And I'm really pleased that our work in BC began long before the Paris Accord with even a twinkle in the eyes of our international health ministers. What is good news is that patient-reported experience measures, PREM, and patient-reported outcome measures, PROM, seem to, seem to become, have seemed to become the new currency for comparative performance assessment, and they have an equally or perhaps arguably an even more important role in clinical care. So patient experience surveys, or PREMS, ask patients, how is the care you are receiving? They elicit feedback on the process or the processes of care rather than on its effects. They focus question lines on issues such as communication with healthcare professionals, provision of information, involvement in decisions, physical comfort, which usually uh, refers to pain control, emotional support, and care transition. Achieving benefit from this resource requires well-designed questionnaires, as well as a commitment to act on the results. Problems ask patients, how are you doing? They are standardized questionnaires to elicit people's subjective reports of the personal impact of illness and treatment, including physical functioning, ability to maintain daily activities, and emotional well-being. In other words, health-related quality of life. The results can be compared with previous measurements from the same individual or the same group to measure change over time, or with those from a reference group or subgroup to compare against an external norm or standard. And Rick is going to be uh, providing more information about this shortly. Rick and I actually coined an expression saying that together, PREMS plus, or plus sign, PROM, equals better together. They provide information about what matters to patients and allow us to measure and monitor our progress towards person-centered care. And if you remember only one the thing about today... ...is disconnected unless there is at least one authenticated user present to join as... <laughs> so if you remember only one thing about today's um, presentation, remember that at the heart of every data point in healthcare is a person. Our BC survey program 
has been designed to give people who use our healthcare services a voice in improving the quality of the care and services they receive. It reflects their true lived experiences and allows us to monitor those experiences and outcomes as they change over time. So I'm going to focus on PREMS and then Rick is going to focus on PROMS. And what we've shown here in this particular slide is that there, um, is, uh, there are different frameworks um, that uh, have uh, evolved over time. I mentioned the Picker Institute, which began in the 1980s. Um, but there are different frameworks. And what you can see here is that there is a significant amount of overlap. And in fact, the, um, the fact that there is not agreement on one consistent framework for how we define patient-centered care was never seen by us in British Columbia to be a uh, limitation. It was rather the beginning of a conversation with patients, with care providers, and with policymakers as we undertook each of the sector surveys which Donna um, identified for you as a starting place for our conversation in terms of what were the important uh, construct from the perspective of patients that we wanted to measure. So as Donna indicated, the first data set that's being released to researchers, researchers is the acute inpatient 2016-17 um, uh, data set. And so uh, what I'm going to do now is in the next several slides provide you with an overview of what the survey instruments uh, that we use for this particular sector survey comprised. So the acute inpatient survey is called the Canadian Patient Experiences Survey for Inpatient Care, or the CPESIC. And it's comprised of two sets of questions. One of our guiding principles in British Columbia is that we never reinvent the wheel if there is a ready-to-wear uh, instrument that has good strong psychometric properties. And so together with a national um, uh, group of, uh, of provinces across the country and the Canadian Institute for Health Information, we made the decision to adopt in its entirety the Hospital Consumer Assessment of Healthcare Providers and Systems questionnaire that was developed by the U.S. Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And HCAPS is the way that we pronounce the Hospital Consumer Assessment of Healthcare Providers and Systems Questionnaire. However, we recognized that the HCAPS survey was developed primarily for accountability purposes, and that in British Columbia, we wanted to have a tool that not only addressed accountability, but also would provide information on patient-centered care to support local QI. And so together across the country with KaiHi, we developed Canadian content, and we included representation from Accreditation Canada, patients representing the Canadian Patient Safety Institute, the Change Foundation, Statistic Canada, a professor from the University of Toronto, Dr. Michael Murray, for analytical support, and we engaged an international panel of experts. Of importance is the fact that both the CPESIC and the HCAPS, which is now embedded within the CPESIC, is the fact that both these instruments are in the public domain and are free for your use. The HCAPS content um, of the CPESIC includes 32 questions. Uh, seven of those questions are demographic questions, and 25 of those questions are the core questions, which um, include 21 evaluative questions, and uh, I can't even see what the four is there, um, but um, the four, oh, greener. greener. So those are gateway questions, so uh, patients skip questions if the uh, four screeners don't uh, apply to them. And so what you can see on this slide is that the HCAPS questions have been organized into seven composite measures. The composite measures uh, typically are several questions that make up these uh, particular um, uh, dimensions or domains, um, as well as two individual items, 
and two global items, which are global ratings. The Canadian content of the CPESIC um, similarly has questions that uh, have been organized into dimensions, which are composites, as well as uh, uh, demographic items. We have, as Donna indicated, adopted uh, Statistics Canada's uh, self-reported uh, ethnicity question, which is used on the Census Canada questionnaire, as well as two global rating questions. And as I indicated, the Canadian additional questions and dimensions focus on patient perspectives related to the dimensions of patient center care. In addition, in British Columbia over time, um, we have developed uh, Made in BC content and these are included in the survey instruments that we use across sectors. And in this particular sector, we've included a maternity module that was developed um, in order to be able to report some uh, questions of particular interest uh, to women who entered acute care hospital and had an inpatient stay due to a childbirth experience. We included a surgical module, so again, patients that were admitted um, through um, either an elective or an emergency admission for a surgical operation or procedure, a pediatrics module for patients that were seen at BC Children's Hospital or on a pediatric unit or in a pediatric bed in an acute care um, hospital stay, a rehab module that was fielded with patients who were in a designated rehab bed or in a freestanding rehab facility, we developed a module of questions to focus on uh, the experience of patients who moved uh, between locations uh, within an acute care hospital. So moving from the emergency department to the acute care um, bed, from a critical care bed to a medical bed, et cetera. And then lastly, patient safety modules that focused on hand hygiene and medication reconciliation and these questions were developed together in partnership with um, those groups in British Columbia with uh, clinical expertise in this area. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Rick Sawatsky to talk about um, PROM. Oh, sorry, Donna's just reminding me I'm supposed to pause for questions before we give it to Rick. Uh, that's right. And actually, um, Donna, I did receive a couple of questions for you, and if anyone has questions for Lee, you can send them into the chat box. But Donna, um, if you have a moment, maybe you could answer um, a couple of these, uh, and then we'll see how we're doing on time. The first one was from Colleen McGavin from the BC Support Unit, and she asked, um, she said, Donna mentioned effective use of data. Can she provide some concrete examples just to put some flesh on that statement? Uh, is, the refer is that referring to the value chain where we talk about action planning, I think? That's a good question. Colleen, you can um, unmute your mic if you would like to clarify. Just wanting to Hi, Donna. Hi, Donna. Hi, Yeah, there was just um, in, your, in your part of the talk uh, a comment about how the uh, data has been used effectively and so I was just curious if you could provide any examples of how that's been used, either in a health authority setting, a hospital setting, whatever, um, to, I would assume, for quality improvement initiatives. Like, are you aware of any examples of how it's actually been used? Yeah, yeah. that's a good question. And I'm actually going to pass it over to Lena because she's much more familiar with um, the action planning and implementation side of things. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to give two examples, uh, Colleen. One is Donna referred to the mini toolkits uh, that we've developed. Uh, so one example is the mental health and substance use sector um, survey that uh, we uh, conducted in British Columbia. And at the end of that survey, we developed a mechanism for the participating uh, sites to be able to use, do ongoing data collection in order to inform what were priorities arising from the survey in their local areas. So we assisted them with the interpretation of the results, looking at what was uh, important from 
um, the perspective of their patients, and then we developed the tools for them to be able to field the survey on an ongoing basis to look at that, that information in order to inform local tests of change. So that's one example. The second example that I would give is one that has actually been getting quite a lot of traction in British Columbia, across Canada, and even internationally now. And that is the work that we did on um, fielding questions with patients who had uh, intravenous therapy. So they received an, uh, an IV uh, during their hospital stay. And uh, what we did was we reported on the results of uh, those uh, questions that related to IV therapy on a weekly basis. And uh, we reported that to a group of clinicians and patients who had worked with us to develop the module of questions. And we then um, made decisions about tests of change, which were fielded in three specific um, hospitals during the time that we were still in field. And uh, we made uh, changes to the processes of care in real time while the survey was in field over a three month period of time. And the specific questions that we focused on were um, whether patients were given information about when to call their nurses when they experienced certain symptoms with their uh, intravenous therapy. And so in real time, we made uh, tests of change related to that with a laminated card that was given to patients and we were able to track the effectiveness of that intervention based on the patient voice throughout the time that we were in the field. So those are just a couple of examples. Great, uh, I'll put forward another question that I received again from Colleen. Donna also mentioned that there has been the patient voice at every step. Can you describe how that looks aside from patients completing surveys or doing interviews? Uh, did you have patient partners on the working group? Yes, we do. Um, I'm just pulling up the value chain. Do you want to oh, speak to that? Sure, I, can, I think I, you want to speak to sure it. Sure, I can speak to it. So, uh, Colleen, we have uh, patients who sit on our provincial sort of steering committee or working group, as it's called. Um, and uh, we also engage uh, patients at our consultation groups. Um, so, a consultation group is uh, brought together to to advise on every aspect of the planning and implementation, including the rollout um, of our surveys. Um, patients are um, selected based on uh, diversity of voices and experiences, including regional diversity. Um, and patients have been involved, for example, using the example of the IV therapy initiative, we brought patients together to help us map the patient journey we brought patients together to work with us on that um, uh, consultation group to assist with the development of the questions. We uh, reach out to patients to do cognitive testing of any new questions or any time we make a tweak or a change to an instrument um, to confirm that the questions um, matter to patients or are important to patients as well that the uh, uh, questions uh, measure what we intend to measure. So those are a few examples of um, how we engage patients in our um, planning. And should we add that? I mean, it's, it's a work in progress too. We're always trying to think about how sure. to engage patients at every stage. And we talk to patients about that as well. So some of the work with the patient-centered measurement uh, methods cluster, the support unit, we went to the different uh, regions, uh, the different health authorities in BC, and we asked patients, how can we do this better? What are we doing that's working? What stages should patients be engaged in? What stages do you think um, maybe patients don't need to be as engaged in? So I think uh, it's also a work in, in progress as well. Great, thanks very much. Uh, to both of you. So I think we're going to turn it over to Rick at this point. Is that correct? Yes. Great. Yep. Thank you. Um, and thanks for this um, introduction, Donna and uh, Nina. So I'm going to add to this conversation by focusing, uh, by providing a bit of a background and introduction to patient reported outcome measures um, that are included in several of the surveys conducted by the Office of Patient Centered Measurement. 
Um, and as introduced by Lena, um, whereas patient reported experience measures focus on how the care is provided. So from a donor obedient perspective, they focus on process of care mostly. Uh, patient uh, reported outcome measures focus more on uh, how people are doing in terms of their own self-perceived health and quality of life. So they focus on outcomes of care from the patient's point of view. And historically, problems have also been referred to as measures of health-related quality of life. So we're thinking of broad health here quite broadly. Um, these types of measures uh, are intended to focus on measuring outcomes from the patient's point of view without any influence of a healthcare provider or any other person. This is the literal definition of PROMS uh, from the, from, that is a, a quote from the FDA, um, but it points towards the idea of really getting at the patient's point of view. Of course, we collect a lot of clinical data and assessment data through uh, healthcare providers, but this is one opportunity to really get information directly from the patient without um, um, influence of anyone else. There are many different problem instruments available. They can be roughly divided into generic instruments, um, disease or population-specific instruments, and individualized PROMs. And for the Office of Patient-Centered Measurement Surveys, the focus has thus far been on generic PROMs, which are broadly applicable to most people, irrespective of the particular disease or type of healthcare received. The slide you are looking at right now provides a description of nine of the most commonly used generic PROM instruments. And, um, it's presented here to give you a little bit of an overview of what these instruments typically measure. The stacked bars represent different health domains represented in each of the instruments, and the numbers represent the number of items or questions measuring that domain. As you can see, although most PROMs measure some aspects of physical, mental, and social health, they do so to different degrees. This is referred to as domain coverage. So each PROM has a different type of domain coverage. They don't measure the same thing. For example, some PROMs like AQUAL and SF instruments place relatively more emphasis on mental health, whereas others predominantly emphasize aspects of physical health. And some PROMs like the SF family of instruments provide a balance of approximately equal representation of physical and mental health out, uh, items, but also including some aspects of social health. In addition to coverage, it's also important to consider the variability in the number of items, which range from only six items for, for example, the EQ5D, to uh, nearly 80 items for the quality of well-being measure. And of course, longer instruments are obviously more burdensome, uh, but they also typically provide broader coverage and more sensitive measurements. And so a balance needs to be struck between uh, shorter instruments uh, that may be less sensitive and not as broad in coverage and longer instruments. In addition to coverage and length, the different PROM instruments also uh, vary in the extent to which they provide reliable and valid information about each of the domains. And this, of course, depends on the purposes for which the information is, is used. And the review cited here provides a reliability and validity information about each of the PROM instruments listed here, specific to the context of primary and community care. And there's many similar types of uh, uh, reviews available for different types of contexts of care. Uh, next slide. So when analyzing PROMS data, um, and also when considering their reliability and their validity, and when selecting an appropriate instrument, it is important to consider the purposes for which the results will be used. Broadly speaking, purposes can be classified into micro, meso, and macro levels of decision making. The inclusion of prompts and health ideas allows us to, con to conduct analyses to inform uh, each of these levels of decision making. 
At the micro level, we can conduct individual level analyses focusing on how self-perceived health outcomes could be used to inform decisions of point of care by integrating problems with other sources of clinical and administrative information. At the meso level, prompts can be used to compare different services and treatments. They can also be an important part of program evaluation and analyses focused on cost consequences or cost effectiveness. And at the macro level, prompts can provide important information about the overall population and different groups within the population, thereby informing health policy and potential inequities. Inclusion of PROMs in health ideas allows for conducting these types of analyses by linking PROMs data with a wealth of other clinical and administrative data. Next slide, please. Um, on this next slide, it basically takes that same information from the, from the previous slide and just puts it in a different context. PROMs and PROMs used for different purposes and by different audiences. Uh, PROMs are used by managers and decision makers for program evaluation and quality of improvement. This relates a lot to the meso level of care. They also, can also be used in routine clinical practice uh, by clinicians and patients, and also for healthcare policy and, and research. The inclusion of PROMs in health ideas provides opportunity to do research relevant to each of these areas. Next slide. Now, before I say more about uh, the PROMs included in the Acute Care IP survey, this is the last slide before I go there, it is important to know that PROMs can provide different types of measures or scores. So we've already talked about domain coverage. They can measure different things, but they can also measure these things in different ways. And the same PROM instrument can actually provide different types of scores. All PROM instruments obviously can provide information about the distribution of each item. So the instrument, the PROM instrument consists of a series of items that measure, uh, say, mental and physical health status, and we can get distributions of those items. And in some cases, this could be quite informative. For instance, the general health status measure could be quite informative. However, it is important to keep in mind that the items for PROM have typically been selected with the purpose of obtaining some form of summary measure, measuring an overarching construct. For example, a PROM may include a question about whether a person can walk a flight of stairs. Relative to the many different questions that could be asked about walking, kneeling, stooping, and physical function, this single item may or may not be the most informative for a particular patient. However, the intent of the item is for it to be combined with other items for the purposes of measuring an overarching construct, in this case, physical functioning or physical health. In many cases, therefore, the focus on PROMs is mostly on the construct that is being measured rather than the individual item. And this is a distinguishing factor relative to PROMs. There are three types of summary measures for PROMs. Um, the first are the psychometric measures of particular dimensions or domains uh, of health and health-related quality of life. These measures are based on psychometric theory about how different items can be combined for the purposes of measuring overarching dimensions, also referred to as domains. Many problems and health-related quality of life instruments have been developed based on psychometric theory for the purposes of measuring a variety of their dimensions pertaining to physical, social, uh, uh, emotional, psychological, and even existential health and well-being. The second type of summary measure is the utility scores, uh, uh, based scores. These scores measure the relative value that society places on living uh, in a particular health state. The health states are based on the PROM instrument, that is the answers provided by the patients or participants completing the PROM instrument. And then scoring algorithms are subsequently applied to obtain a measure of value based placed on each health state. These scores are particularly useful for economic analysis purposes. 
health utility measures such as the EQ5D have been specifically developed for this purpose. And some instruments produce only a single, only single item and, and, and utility-based scores like the EQ5D, whereas other instruments produce only single item and psychometric measures. And then there are some instruments, some of the psychometric instruments that in addition to the psychometric measures also can be used to compute utility scores. And the SF family of instruments is an example of this. And then finally, the third type of score, a summary score, has to do with norm-based scoring, which population norms are developed to allow for comparisons with a particular reference group, such as the general population or any particular group within that population. Next slide. So for the um, uh, uh, acute care sector, inpatient sector survey, we have uh, included the Veterans Round 12 item instrument. This instrument measures eight different health domains, including role limitations, physical, role limitations, emotional, bodily pain, energy, fatigue, social functioning, mental health, general health, and physical functioning. It is a multidimensional psychometrically, psychometrically developed tool. Next one. The VR12 is part of the SF family of instruments, or is often referred to as the SF family of instruments, uh, which was based on the medical outcomes uh, study completed in the, in the 1980s. The SF36 uh, was the original instrument that arose from that, and it was available in 19, uh, became available in 1990. And there have been several versions since. One of the versions, uh, revisions of the SF36 is the VR36. VR stands for Veterans RAND, and it was developed um, to increase sensitivity in the scoring by adding some response options and also changing a, a few of the, the questions that the terminology used in, in a, a few of the questions so as to make it more current. And more recently, uh, a shorter version has been developed of the VR36 called the VR12 and it's simply to provide more efficient form of measurement. The VR instruments are uh, almost identical to the SF uh, version 2 instruments. Uh, the only difference, uh, well, not the only difference, but the main difference being that the VR 12 and 36 are freely available for use, whereas the SF 36 and uh, SF 12 version 2 are proprietary and require a fee. Uh, next slide. Um, oh, we just skipped the slide, just one back there, please. So um, here you can see how the items are organized into different scales and uh, um, summary scores. So you can see the 12 items that produce can, can be used to obtain eight scales, often referred to as domains or dimensions. And those A scales can then be summarized into two overarching physical and mental health component scales. Next slide. Here you can then see the distribution of items. There's actually 14 items. 12 of the items are used for the scoring of these domains. And then there's two items at the bottom there that measure change in physical and mental health status. And you can see that each item, uh, different items have different types of response options some going from excellent to poor, some using more frequency type of response options, such as none, a little, some, most, or all of the time. And then, of course, the change questions asking people to compare to a previous state. Next slide. So those summary scores, as mentioned, can be summarized, uh, or those items can be summarized into eight health domains. Those are often scored from zero to 100. Um, and they're often represented of profiles that are particularly useful for comparing across different domains. There's different ways of scoring these uh, dimensions or domains. Um, what we've used here is the extensibility scoring algorithms provided by the developers, uh, Salem and Kaziz and his team, uh, which allow for um, a comparison with the original SF36 scores. So the scores, can, they produce comparable scores. The next slide. 
And then there is the, um, the component scores, like I mentioned. These are often um, referred to as, uh, as um, um, are scaled on a normative uh, scale with a population mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 10. And so this is just a different way of use for normative comparisons um, as also a scale provided by the VR12. And then finally, as I mentioned, there's the utility-based scores. Utility-based scores uh, refer to health state valuations that represent relative value that society places on living in health states defined by responses to the VR12 questions. And these are particularly useful for economic purposes. They range from zero to 100, where 100 is a perfectly valued health state and zero is considered to be equal to death, and less than, lower than zero is considered to be worse than death. So that concludes the introduction to prompts. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Rick. Um, that's a lot of great information in there. So Sarah, uh, because we just have a couple minutes left, I'll let you quickly go through your slides. Okay, okay, thank you. So, um, hi everyone, my name is Sarah Kesselring and I am a project coordinator with Population Data BC. Um, I'm just giving a short overview of POP data and how you can access the acute inpatient survey through us. Um, so, Population Data BC is an organization that facilitates research on health, well-being and development. Um, researchers can request a broad range of data sets through POP data, including now the acute inpatient survey. Um, a snapshot of the other data that researchers can request access to via POP data is shown here on the slide. Um, can you switch to my next slide? Thank you. Um, so to apply for data, researchers need to complete POP, POP data's online data access request form that researchers can access through our website. Um, you'll need a POP data account to complete this form. And a link to where you can register for an account, if you don't have one already, is included on my final slide. Um, we have a team of people at uh, POP Data called our Data Access Unit, who work with researchers to prepare their data requests and answer their questions, and ensure that when a data access request goes to data stewards for their review, that it is complete and has all the information they need to evaluate their request. Um, so the data access unit coordinates and facilitates the various stages of the data access process that are shown here on the slide, um, from initial inquiries from researchers and helping with application planning and completion uh, to submission to the data stewards on behalf of the researcher. So now you can go to my final slide. Um, so if you're hoping to use the acute inpatient survey uh, that we've discussed today, please contact us at POP Data and we'll be happy to go over the process with you and provide advice and guidance um, for your data access request. And um, my contact information is there if you have any questions because I think we're out of time, um, as well as the link for where you can um, sign up for a POP Data account. Amazing job, Sarah. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, I want to say a huge thank you to all of our presenters. Any final comments or thoughts, Donna and Lena? I'll unmute you. Sarah. Um, thanks, Lena, Rick, and Sarah for uh, helping me present today. And um, I just wanted to put up this slide that I just skipped over. Uh, we really want to connect with and support researchers who are interested in this data. So if you have any questions or um, uh, you just want to connect with us to learn more about the data, please feel free to contact me. My email is just up here. Thank you. Thank Wonderful. You. Thank you all. And thanks for those of you who joined online. Um, we have our next session uh, of a webinar on January 30th, so I hope you can join us. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.